Uh, okay, got it. Okay, you did press, press recording, thank you. Yes. Okay, um, this is my ideal photo of the Alberta uh, with a farm, water bodies and creek running through the area, two windbreaks and shelter wells. Uh, I always imagine this is ideal, ideal farm uh, in the prairies. Uh, it has uh, absolutely everything in that sense. So I always, I, I love this photo uh, that somebody was taken. Okay, okay, let's see. A little bit more on my business. Um, I have I have a 27 years uh, as a as agroforester. I'm a forest engineer by training. I'm arborist. I'm um, also the uh, professional agrologist as well. I got a whole range of the things from forensic tree expert. I just today got other clients that is planning to go for the legal advice. Uh, to uh, pests, I got probably between 500,000 pests problem in Alberta. Um, I also do lots of from municipalities, uh, from inventory to management plan. And if you do have a natural woodlots, um, I do a forest management plan and as well as design the shelter belts and windbreaks. So it's a range of the services. And I always said to people, if you Google my name, you're going to get a lot of information about myself. So uh, it's easy to find me. I always start with key messages, folks, um, and I will finish with the key messages. And I hope tonight that we'll, I will answer some of that. Um, uh, first thing is, I always say to people, you have to have a reason to plant the trees. And you have to answer that question, what's the reason? And, uh, and also I'll try to cover uh, tonight why trees are long-term investment. It's an asset. It's no different than any asset that you have on your farm or your property in that sense. I will explain to you how shelter built and wind base works. Uh, there's lots of work, and, and again, uh, windbreaks and shelter has been since probably 1930s. It's almost going to be 100 years uh, that people plant trees around the, the around the property. It's science proof, and uh, over and over, latest one was 2016 from United States. It does increase the crop yields, and it does protect your crop, even though you might lose the parts of the land of agriculture for for putting the trees but when you look in the different uh, different calculations and how much you lose and how much you gain the bottom line you will increase the uh, 10 percent in the in the crop overall which is significant when you look at how many uh, farmers and landowners needs to put a more fertilizer uh, to get a 10 percent of the crop is actually it's uh, quite significant uh, increase in the yield with, with uh, no losses in, in, in the long term. If you have a livestock operation, it's really can do lots of good things for you. And I'm going to mention a few of them tonight. Um, it is kind of sad to me that uh, we still today have a soil and water erosion uh, because we, we have a zero till. Most of Alberta farmers do the zero till. But in, in, in the flip coin, even with the zero till, uh, we got uh, some uh, soil erosion on, on the slopes that goes through the wind. And actually the most common erosion is the, is the water. Um, uh, I give a lot of talk in the much bigger pictures. It's what is the loss of the trees uh, to agriculture and basic land conversion. And it is huge impact on the soil and watershed, and especially in the water. And I'm gonna talk tonight about that. Uh, climate change and loss of forest, uh, it uh, really will change your local patterns. I got the other day, uh, I'm going to give a talk to the professional arborist and it's going to be on urban forestry and climate change. And I was looking at some of the data and in one of the studies, they predict that Edmonton might have a weather like a drum heller by 2040, which is not that far away. Um, through the loss of forest or trees, capture snow and rain is a cost local infrastructure. That's one of the lots of people don't know, and it's uh, I uh, don't want to talk about it. And but every year municipalities spend the millions and millions of dollars to fixing the culverts, roads, uh, all range of the things that they spend the millions of dollars to just because of that. The trees, what used to be, do the certain function and they're removed. Uh, either you know recently or in the past, uh, and uh, and the loss of trees and loss of tree cover created lots of problems. The other thing what is changing in a lot uh, lately, especially after so many um, natural disasters that we have, is insurance. Who will pay for it, and how will pay that? And how I want to just mention one thing: what Alberta government brought a new uh, new law, I think, is. Uh, 
if you got, God forbid, lost a house in the fire or in the flood or something like that, government of Alberta give you max $500,000 and one-time payment. On the other coin, so if you are representing municipality, work for municipality or government, uh, government of Alberta will cover 90%. You as a municipality have to cover 10%, which is significant huge significant cost that can be um, many times from the uh, it, it's a lack of the three policies that trigger many litigations i have a, some situation that's very they might go to the court where the local farmers and large farm clear the trees and the surrounding farmers got flooded and the insurance company asked what's the cause and it was, uh, it was, a, it used to be forest, used to be trees, it used to be shelter belts. Now they're removed, um, and overland flooding was a main cause for the flooding, and, and insurance was questioning now how to go around and pay for it, but also look who is guilty of that and, and what's the policies. And uh, as I always said, the tree is a long term asset and, and should be treated the same way as the other asset. Lots of people don't see it that way. In Lacombe County, there is approximately 57,000 acres of the privately owned forest, of natural forest, like every farmer or, or acreage owners or small farmer, doesn't matter, whatever it's privately, it's uh, 56,000 acres, which is 7.3% uh, uh, of total county land. Uh, that's an average. In average, most of the county has a between 7 and 4, 12, 14%. Majority has a 10%. Uh, when we did inventory, uh, we could not, that satellite could not provide us an uh, amount of shelter belts and windbreaks are not included in this number. So, but this is still very significant amount of forest that county uh, is, that's pro uh, that is privately owned in the county. So when you look at the values, um, there is a many of them. Having the trees, they provide uh, uh, many values from soil and water uh, reduction, as I mentioned, increase the crop yields and protect the livestock. It does protect the uh, rural infrastructure, uh, reduce the noise and dust, which lots of people complaining. That's also create a lot of friction, uh, friction between the uh, various land users. Um, and also last but not least, it's increased the property values up to 20%. In Alberta, I did a, one project with Alberta Real Estate Foundation, and we were looking overall, and I was looking various uh, studies that was done. In average, probably between seven and seven and ten percent. Uh, there is, if you do have a trees and nicely um, uh, managed trees on your property, your your real estate will probably be ten percent more higher than uh, without it. So um, that's one of the depending which angle and all of them you can have it if you have a trees and depending what is more most important to you in that sense. So um, the shelter belt and windbreaks, you know, it's yeah, as I said, it's been almost hundred years that we planned them for um, you know, especially uh, at the beginning of dirty thirties. And, it might, and its prime purpose is to use the wind speed. So that, uh, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, but there is a many, many other purposes that I'm gonna mention to you tonight as well that, that uh, wind breaks and shelter bus provide to us. Um, this is what I, um, we used to have a PFRA shelter bus program in Alberta. And in 2013, uh, federal government shut down that program. And, and uh, uh, right now we have a new government uh, program whatsoever come to, the, uh, come to the trees, no any research, which is that's one of the most challenging thing. Um, we have, again, a uh, hard period of time, uh, shut down the research program, a decimator uh, in the ahead, we have a none. And folks, all of my all of the latest research I follow is United States. Uh, I think Trump administration put I think twenty billion dollars for agroforestry in over in in United States. I think Biden also now put twenty five billion dollars in agroforestry. Uh, we have nothing in in Alberta nor Canada. No 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 any incentive whatsoever. Uh, so this is a picture uh, done by the United States uh, uh, government using the uh, uh, wind tunnel. 
by the army, uh, the agro, uh, agroforester approach the army folks and say, hey, I want to use the wind tunnel to see how the wind behaves when we have a barriers. So what they've done, they put a, a small little uh, wooden piece and, and the different angles and different spacing and different everything to show how the wind behaves. When you put the trees on the, on the land, you know, it has to watch for porosity, for the uh, for the angles, for the different heights, for different everything. So what they've done, they just want to, in the wind tunnel, to figure out where and how wind is behaving. And further down the road, what also, um, this is Canadian, uh, and um, Canadian, uh, uh, also we did a research and said, okay, if we have a wind speed of 6, 10, 12 uh, miles per hour, how much down the wind uh, it's called downwind zone. So this is a vector wind zone or speed reduction zone, how much we slow down the wind. And if you have a six, you reduce 60, 30%. If you have 10 miles per hour, you reduce the 50%. If you have a 12, it's, it's a, uh, around the 60%. So it, it's significant reduction of the wind. And that's the, again, uh, main purpose of the shelter belts. So further down, Americans, again, this is a, uh, my dear friend, Craig Stange from North Dakota, um, as I keep all the time contact with Americans, they did a study and they said, okay, let's try outside. So the, after the wind tunnel, they went outside in North Dakota, they put everything else in real environment. And what they're measuring, the heights, how tall, shelter belts should be and the, where the snow is going to land. If we go with a tighter spacing, where the snow is going to land, how much snow is going to be up front and how much is, you know, down, down the wind. They also measure the different, different species and the heights of that, how it is going to go. And again, they simulate by the putting in the real life example. And um, we never done something like that in Canada. And they, are, they said, okay, if we, uh, and, and actually this study was paid by the uh, transportation, United States uh, uh, Department of Transportation because of the car accidents and, uh, and the road blockages. And they said, we need to figure out how we're gonna put the trees to protect our highways and bridges and uh, um, save people lives, of course, and also uh, for the uh, ca uh, catching the water uh, coming out from the open open field. So again, it's it's there is a various reason why they did this, and, and again, that this is a real example of how much how wind behaves when you put up different barriers, and they figured out how much snow is stored. So on the left side, you have a, a snow stores in in tons. And on the bottom is tell you tell you the heights. So it's ten. If you have a 10, 20 feet height of the of the fence or or um, or shelter belt, you would be able to capture eighty tons of snow. It's a huge amount of snow that is uh, uh, that those the trees can capture. And when you remove the trees and you don't have a windbreaks or shelter belts. That snow go from overland and most of them end up in ditches or area where it's stopped. And that is one of the major causes of flooding uh, for damage on infrastructure, for not having the enough moisture in certain fields uh, when doing the drought in dry years and uh, not keeping the moisture in the longer period of time in that sense. But it's a quite bit significant amount of uh, snow that those are just 10 foot uh, uh, shelter belts can capture. If you have a, even a uh, taller, it would be way more. So, so what happened when people do, sadly, still in Alberta, people clear the forest or trees or wind breaks uh, for the various reasons, mostly to expand agriculture, but also some other reasons. What happened when you take those trees out? What changes and how much is the fact? And that's what I'm uh, also going to talk tonight. It's right away, it's increased the uh, speed on the land. And there is a plenty of the good and bad and ugly about increasing the speed of land. The good thing in some area, it's might uh, increase uh, when it's a too wet year, it's increased that uh, uh, pick up the moisture and, and dryness and dry the field much faster. But of course, there's a negative parts. There is a drying your field much, fa much faster, removing the moisture much faster um, and breaking the crops and damaging the crops because of the wind speed. Then, when if you remove the you remove the trees, you have a more issue with the water runoff and erosion. 
and then uh, reduce the moisture. Again, as I mentioned during the dry year, um, all of the snow that you have on, on the field, if you don't have windbreaks or trees uh, naturally happening, end up in ditches. And they solidify in those ditches. And that's what during this uh, springtime, you have a frozen ditches and overland flooding. And that's what uh, wreck our uh, culverts, roads, washouts, bridges, washouts. And in certain area, I know in Lamont County, it was uh, all communities got flooded as a result of that. Um, you have a decreased biodiversity. You have a re reduction of the underground water uh, uh, charges that under charge, uh, recharge underground water because there's nothing to keep the moisture for too long on the open field. And science also prove uh, one of the reason for in, uh, during the uh, 1930s was that a uh, forest west of the, of the prairies and along the Rockies were uh, destroyed by the fire in 1800 and early 1900 and young forests cannot hold the moisture or uh, uh, as much as the mature forest. And they find out that's what also changed the climate in 30s. It's the forest fire on the west that could, there is a uh, loss of forest, mature forest, and loss of uh, uh, moisture capacity in the trees. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides on that. Soil erosion, this is a picture actually from the Lamont County. Uh, uh, Jolene, I took from your news, newsletter. And the uh, picture on the right is from the Western producers. And this was done, uh, and Western producers did an uh, uh, interview with uh, uh, scientists from University of Manitoba um, saying that uh, soil erosion caused farmers $3.1 billion a year in year losses. And he definitely explained uh, what kind of soil erosion was happening and that is still happening, even with the zero, zero till. And uh, we don't have as many uh, of those, uh, you know, big soil uh, dust, you know, clouds that is coming around. So we, again, zero till reduce that and, and uh, doesn't have, but it's still in the, on the slopes, um, it is still erosion is uh, happening through the wind. Most of the erosion is the picture here in the county is coming out from the, uh, from the overland flooding or rain, sudden rain that is just has a washout and, and remove the, remove the uh, uh, soil. Um, and on the map on the bottom is actually from 2004, that county developed map, which I'm very pleased to see that, to be honest. And it shows the area with the severe, in, in uh, yellowish color, it said severe. Uh, just north of the Lacombe and south of Lacombe and the east parts of the of the counties are severe severe soil wind erosion, and then you have a moderate at the at the, at the center on the, on the east side, and then across the highway where you have a more forested land, you have a way less, uh, if any, soil erosion. In that sense, that is 2004. Now, since price of the crop went. 2013 or up upwards are so high that what we start seeing the land conversion and clearing, including the west parts of the probably a province. So that what probably now is increased actually matter of fact, the soil erosion compared to 2004. 2004, we have a depressed uh, crop price, uh, livestock price was after the BSC. And uh, so you might not have lots of activities on farm, uh, but since the price of the crop went up and bigger machinery, uh, you might see much more land clearing, uh, wetlands and forest and wind breaks, and that will definitely increase the soil erosion. And of course, negative parts of the soil erosion, it's the whole sediments end up in our water system. And that create a pile of chain reaction uh, come, when it comes to the water. Um, trees and water. I'm just going to give you a crash course. And I always explain to people, if you guys take now one tree and cut and take the, let's say that tree is a thousand pounds. Okay. 50% or, or 500 pounds of the tree is the water. Other 50% or 500 pounds is the wood. So it's almost what's the, what's the uh, amount of wood in one tree is equal amount of, of the water that you have on every day. So the, the, the beauty of the tree is that uh, can absorb up to 18 inches of rain 
to release and surface. So when you have a heavy rain and you go under the forest, all of the leaves, everything else slow down everything and water slowly go on your soil. And if you go on the pasture or you go on open field, when that rain comes after a minute or two, the top layer of the soil is saturated and water doesn't go further. And that's when you have a flooding. And that's the huge difference. It's, I always said trees are nothing but the water storage in the, in the spring and summertime, in the fall too. Nothing but the water storage. And one balsam poplar tree that you have or hybrid poplar can get a 60 to 300 liters of water per day that goes to the tree. So take the, take the water from the roots, goes through the tree and release, release to the leaves every day. So when you look from that perspective, I always said that the tree is nothing but a uh, water reservoir. The moment you remove that tree, you remove the storage of the water. An open field and pasture cannot hold the water as forest and trees. And I met probably three or 5,000 farmers in Alberta. And they always told me the moment they clear the forest and trees, their water table drop down and they start having the overland flooding and erosion issues. So just keep that in mind. It's really slow. It's really slowly uh, absorb the water from the rain, slowly recharge under aquifer and doesn't let the erosion uh, come uh, to show up on your on your field, and it's as again simple principle. It you you take it, they store it, they evaporate. As I said, balsam poplar can take a three hundred liters a day. That's a hundred gallons Canadian, actually American, uh, or less. And uh, and it's it's slow down slow down uh, uh, the 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 problem with uh, with the too much water uh, on on the land. And then also it's recharged, slowly recharge our uh, uh, aquifer. And with the strong roots, it's just anchoring your anywhere around the riparian area, anywhere on the steep slope on the slopes. But you guys have a somewhere in west parts toward to the mirror east of the Lacombe is uh, it's hilly and goes up and down. And it's, I always said, keep the water trees on the top and try to, that will, that will slow down your erosion any kind of erosion in many ways. Um, as I said, water trees, what tree does. Other thing what we really forget about, the amount of herbicides and pesticides we use and heavy metals uh, that we do have through agricultural operation. Um, same hybrid poplar tree that you have on the windbreak and shelter belt can take up to 80% of the pesticides and fertilizer that is coming off the field to the root system. So don't forget guys, as I said, it's one tree can take a 300 liter water a day. So the water and herbicides and pesticides that's coming from runoff, that tree has ability to take it and store inside of the tree and doesn't let, the, let go into the, into the water system. So it's also reduced the cost of drinking water as well and reduced the cost of flooding. Um, I think I was in, when the uh, high river flood happened, I was a night before in, in, in that community and I was looking the river, Sheep River, and I said, my goodness, why did you clear the, uh, some uh, big cottonwoods over there? Well, development or whatever it was. And I said, that's what keep the stabilized the water bank, uh, the, the river bank, that not to jump very easy water. And uh, day later, it's, it, that's exactly where the river jump and flood the, flood the community. It was also one bridge and railway over there. So it's very important that, you know, keeping the trees along the water bodies is crucially important as well as uh, in uplands. Um, field, uh, field wind breaks, um, you have a picture of two of them. Uh, as I said, it's increased the yield in overall field. Uh, it does protect your uh, uh, road infrastructure, doesn't let all of the snow end up on ditches, um, improve the microclimate for crops. Uh, and, uh, but there's a negative part for lots of people say that I have a big equipment and I cannot get around, it's a nuisance. And you definitely will have some crop losses 
uh, uh, close to the trees because of mostly because shade and the root system. But overall, keeping those windbreaks in open fields is in the long term, it's extremely beneficial. It's really saddens me when I see the farmers are clearing them, really not realizing how much beneficial uh, they are. The other thing what also you know, with these trees and especially on the fields, they are home or so many beneficial insects, so many beneficial viruses, bacteria, fungi, that are really doing the biological control of the monoculture that we have in Alberta. You have a canola, wheat, barley, and a few other crops. That's it. And the, 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 the ecosystem of the trees is totally different and doesn't harm anything on the, on the agriculture crop. And, but they're home of so many beneficial. And the moment you remove them as well as the wetlands, you're removing the free services, free biological services that that piece of land provide to your agriculture crop. And I think the Canola Council of Canada, realizing that if you go on their website, you're gonna find out a lot of information about pollinators and beneficial insects. And they will tell you, keep the trees and wetlands and shelter belts and windbreaks, not to remove them. Because of that, they realize we if canola is monoculture, nothing but canola. So um, having those is extremely important. And if you could plant them, it will be in the long term very, very beneficial to your to your crop. Um, this was a study that was American starts, and I was a part of it as well as person from Manitoba uh, for all of the great uh, Great Plains. And uh, as I said, Americans put way more money than we did. And basically what they did, they looked at where the shelter belts and they measured the distance, where is the increase and where is the decrease. And year after year to figure out how much is the increase and decrease as a result of the, having the shelter belts. And they measured in real, real, you know, combined yield instant, how much and where it is and different crops and different everything. And this was, I think, from Kansas, one of them. And whatever you turn, uh, that's soya bean, as he mentioned, response to the windbreak effect showing the yield increase 46% uh, of the time. So it's almo almost half the time it's increase, increase, increase. With 16 years, 16% uh, of the average yield increase. Same thing with uh, with the ten percent uh, average yield increase uh, of the of the wheat, and this one on the right side is also in 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 Ontario, and they were showing the how much is increase in the yield, and how much are losses and where their losses. So if you have a one height of the trees and maybe one and a half height of the trees, that's where you have a losses, and then you have a, a over there down the road much more um, uh, the gains. And they come up with the same same uh, conclusion. Whatever you do, having the trees on this, it will help you out the overall crop. And not just that, it's the overall health of your crop. Not having the break on the wind and, and problem with lodging and also biological um, uh, control services that trees, trees provide to the crop. As I said, uh, forest or tree biodiversity and monoculture crops, there is a thousands and millions of insect diseases, fungi uh, that are extremely beneficial to that piece of land. And they are home to lots of beneficial insects that is gonna uh, go after the bad ones in your crop. Um, one of the things I gave the talk way back on the wood wide web. Do you guys know that every plant or trees has to be in symbiotic relationship with, with the fungi? And one of the major impact of that mycorrhiza fungi is the, according to, to the, some of the studies that they've done, is the fertilizer and chemicals. And uh, some of the agricultural folks realizing uh, not using the fertilizers increase the beneficial mycorrhiza to your crop and increase the yield. Uh, using the fertilizer in another way is actually decreasing the level of mycorrhiza. So it's very complex. It's, it's really not easy, uh, but more and more science is coming up and saying, you know, this is what we have to more pay attention to it. Um, and the same thing with, uh, with the many insects that is really, uh, the trees are home to them and as well as wetlands, and they will, they will go after the bad ones that you have in agriculture crop. 
And the livestock operation, especially in Lacombe County, you guys have a dairy as well, in intensive livestock operation. Uh, overall, it's on the open range. It's having, if you ever, guys, I travel a lot. And anytime when it's cold and I see the uh, livestock outside and you have a small bluff of willows or trees, all the time livestock is there. Or during the hot day or when it's plus 35 or 34 or over 30, you will see the most of the animals uh, going under the shade. So it's, it's really helps the well-being of the animals. If you have an intensive operation, it's, uh, there is a study after study that reduces the odor impact, intercepted dust, coming from those operations. Um, definitely improve the appeal because people might not see it uh, if you have a, uh, if you have a trees uh, around your operation. Noise reduction up to 30% and the reduced energy consumption. So if you have a, a shelter around your, around your pig farm or chicken farm or, or dairy, they will uh, provide a cooling to those operation uh, probably up to 80% and uh, also provide a shelter during the cold weather, probably up to 25%. So your, your bill as well. So, and on top of that is a well-being. So you can plant the trees and most of the time, I think now livestock operation, they require to having the shelter belts around, the, around their operation uh, through the new act. So yes, keep those trees around your livestock operation. Design it properly. That's one of the biggest problem. They, they're not, trees are not, designed properly around these operations. And sometimes definitely if you plant them too close, all of the snow end up in, in the area that you don't want to. If you plant too far, it doesn't do the function as well either. So it's, you have to put some of the thoughts to how to design uh, shelter belts around the, around the intensive livestock operation. Roadside shelter belts, it's, if you have them, uh, number one, increase the privacy. So if you look this road and there is an entire farm intensive livestock operation on the other side of the shelter belt, you can pass by and have a slightest idea about what is over there. It's definitely trapped the snow from going on the, on the highways. And many times when I travel throughout Alberta, anytime when I, when I hit the area where is the tree, my vehicle goes on the left or, or on the right, depending which direction I'm going, uh, because the wind, wind it's reduced right away and you feel that you feel it on your vehicle and also during the during the summer time it's reduced a significant amount of dust uh, that going into your property now cost of the removing the trees as i said very few people will talk about that very few people they really never put their thoughts what is the cost to the farmers but also what's the cost to the, your uh, Lacombe County or, 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 or community that you live. And one of the direct consequences of removing the trees year after years, and this was a picture actually from MDO Smoky River. This was where was the road and this was where, the, where was the road. And it's, I know this area quite well, and it's a springtime. It was the trees on, on the east and it was trees on the west side. The farmers come and clear it, gone. And the snow froze in ditches and overland flooding. And it was a millions of dollars to fix the roads, to fix the culverts, to fix the bridge. You can see here on the right side, this is where is the, 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 the snow accumulated from open field and they froze and became a, like a solid rock. And they don't melt very fast. And that's why you have a water flowing over and do the, all, of the, all of the damages. Every county, some more, some less, but pretty much every county, if I would go to their public works and ask them you know, how much they spent, and I can guarantee you that most of the time where the area was damaged like this, it is the area where the trees were removed either a few years ago or many years ago. And this is a very common, common problem in the springtime. Uh, this is from Lethbridge. Uh, yeah, it's a Lethbridge, and as you can see, this is where is the, the, the shelter belt was put here and there was snow was kept here, didn't go. Open water follow, follow this area. This is where the clog and follow, follow and flooding. Millions of dollars in insurance were claimed. Lost of the production, uh, fixing the roads. I remember that here alone, Lethbridge County spent $17 million in certain areas just fixing culverts. 
it, it was huge cost. And nobody, and, and when I always said, okay, they, like, if I look this these photos, I think this is done by the Western producer, I think, or somebody else, I can't remember. Um, and, um, and I look at it and I said, okay, exactly I know where the water is gonna jump. Here, if you have a trees here, this water and snow wouldn't go into ditch, wouldn't go in the ditch, block the ditch, follow the water, block the ditch, didn't go further, go lo lower end. So it, it's, it's a very, very uh, real uh, that is happening. Uh, in Lacombe County, this is again, uh, Jeline from you guys. Um, I got this uh, uh, from Village of Cly from the flooding. I got this from newsletter that is happening with the frozen, frozen ditches and uh, clog and, and also damage the infrastructure. And on top of that, you have this um, summer or spring erosion uh, that this huge amount of water is coming from the field. So it, it might not be the same as some other counties, but you do have in your county. The coast, this is a, done by a picture that you see is in uh, county of Lamont. Councilor invited me to present to them and they have a flooding 2017, 2018, 2019. Lo road closure, look at the list of the road that was closed, totally closed, okay? And, uh, and the coast to fixing, to repairing, to everything else. So the county annual cost is like county Calvert is $10,000. Calvert's bigger Calvert is 50, 1.5 million bridge, uh, dollar bridges and ditches and everything else. It's a huge. And then we also calculated how much loss is due to unseeded acres and acres that uh, with the crop losses and also the cost in the small communities and, and farms as well. Um, and business delays and property damages. When you look at this, if we uh, just the unseeded crop, we calculated roughly, I think well, between 120 and $140 million of the losses to the farmers for not just able to see the crop. It was too wet. So, um, and again, county has to fix the roads and bridges and everything else. Uh, you know, having the farmers like this get stuck because of that. Of that. Uh, loss of soils, how much loss of soil is happening in, uh, during this flooding. So these things are very, very real. Uh, one of the flood mitigation, I was using this uh, with the Sturgeon County and we tried to, they, they're doing a, a tree inventory and they try to predict where the flooding might occur. Where is the open area? How much trees is over there? And how much is wetlands as well? And uh, and try to encourage the people to plant the trees to avoid the, some of the some of the uh, floodings. Um, and uh, whatever you look at, the planting the trees and keeping the trees is way cheaper than uh, building the larger infrastructure to handle more water. Whatever you turn, guys, in one way or another. Um, cost, who will pay? I have, this was picture for the for the fire, which is other totally different topic. In 2020, Alberta was hitting $9 billion uh, for the disaster cost. So, and it's estimate 2.3 billion from 2010, 2016. Um, and every year is getting bigger and bigger. Um, actually, they, the, the people who are interested most in climate change is insurance, insurance companies. All of the fires in California and everything else, it's the insurance company that have to do the huge payouts. And they are more interested in Canadian in the climate change than anybody, because they are the one that is paying, uh, paying people who was the fire, flooding, insects, and all kinds of things that is the create a problem. So um, uh, Canadian municipalities uh, uh, and Insurance Bureau of Canada, they find out the cost estimate $5.3 billion a year, which is quite significant. I probably way, way bigger now. Um, in that sense. So when it's come to also liabilities uh, of, the, of the losing the trees and tree removal do create liabilities. You, you will have a more floods. You will have a destruction of the infra, uh, rural, uh, road infrastructure. You will have a habitat loss and, and loss of biodiversity. You will have a reduced crop production either for the uh, drought, either for the, um, for the flood or other issues. Uh, you will have uh, some lo soil uh, losses and degradation. And uh, last but not least, as I said, the more and more you will have a, a source of conflict for different land users. I, I have uh, an area around the west of, east of Camrose, uh, big farms, 
and uh, some of the people cleared the clear the shelter belts and windbreaks and did impacted other people or variation and they asked me what to do i mean it's a private property they can do whatever they want but it's greatly impacted others so what do you do the other thing what is also significant i think i mentioned to you guys uh government alberta according to the 2021 budget regarding the changes in disaster recovery program they implement 9010 cost that means you as a municipality are hooked for 10 percent of the cost of the fire flood and other disaster for many municipality that would lead to bankruptcy if you if the government of alberta said you uh, you guys in slave lake you or fort mcmurray you have to cover 10 percent of the cost it's huge on the private level on your own farm or your own property as a homeowner you have a 500,000 uh, funding cap per homeowner one time limit so if you have a flood in this year and they pay you you are not going to have a next year and then insurance company is going to say hold on we might not, we not provide you insurance so it's very real and it's People have to think this change that can affect you personally, but also as well as the counties. Uh, many, many things that come to the private forest and trees on private land. It's simple. There is no bylaws, policies, regulation, nothing. Uh, still today, many, and if you have a forest land, you can bulldoze and burn it today. You just get the fire permits. That's it. Even though the trees are along the riparian area and everything else, you have a water act, you have a soil act, you have all kinds of acts none of them will be enforced that's why you see the clearing of the of the forest and nobody nobody do anything and until probably getting now more and more that private private landowner will go after the landowner legally and try to prove um, um again having the some of the tree bylaws and regulation will help lots of things plus education plus provide education to the people when it come to the trees and uh, it's very important. So I, I'm, I'm not just go for regulatory things. It has to be level of education. And again, this is where it comes from. You know, when you talk to the political leaders and everybody else, everybody talk about gray infrastructure, roads, bridges, signs, culverts, everything else. And county has to every year look how much county own uh, infrastructure. Nobody talk about what we call green infrastructure, wetlands, trees, prairie land. They provide the services are for free. And I hope tonight you got some sense what kind of services tree on your land provide to you and to your neighbor and to your community. And we, I always, we always try to put a, a real dollar value on that. So as I always said, as the trees get older, uh, the, you increase your assets, you increase your benefits versus the green, uh, gray infrastructure as, as this bridge getting older, the value of the bridge is decreasing. Same thing for anything else. So that's that's a different, you know, planning and putting the trees is truly investment in the long-term asset uh, as it grows. Uh, what I did, one of the projects to prove that was with Sturgeon County and Cardiff Park inventory. It's a small, small hamlet. The county said, you know, we want to try this. And we, I did a uh, data collection, collect lots of trees and information about trees and damages and all kinds of things I did for them. And uh, we use the state of art LIDAR that we speed up the inventory. And this is a LIDAR and we can literally pinpoint where every single tree is here and you can drive by and figure out very quickly what's the inventory so technology really help a lot it really help a lot to do this so what i find out that on individual trees uh the car town of car or hamlet to ha cardiff has a six hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of the of the trees and plus natural forest around the 60 million dollars and on top of that we looked how much carbon is stored and how, what is the value of the carbon. We looked uh, how on annual basis or, or, or oxygen avoided runoff every year. You know, they, they capture around uh, 15,000 cubic meters per year to avoid the flooding, to avoid the damage to the, to the uh, um, um, infrastructure. And again, there is a value on, just on that alone. So 
that this is the values that we take for granted. This is the value that we never ever cal calculate and say, hey, yeah, there is a real value. But now that's that start changing and people start to be more aware of that. Um, why, uh, again, uh, should you conduct a tree inventory? It's not just to figure out the values, but I, I finding out with the, with the project with Sturgeon County uh, we are doing, we are looking now, oh, where is the hazards for the fire? Where is the hazard for the flood? Where is the potential for the power on outrage? Uh, where is the, uh, where is the, they have inventory of, of the culvert or bridges or roads and everything else. And they overlay with the layer of the forest and how much that is going to impact, how much is going to be more and more down the road, regardless of the level of the government, they're going to ask uh, municipality, how do you perform environmental performance? How is biodiversity? How is water protection? How is wildlife protection? And the trees play the huge role. And, uh, and, in law, and as I said, in long term, it does save money. In the same coin, it's increased your asset, increased the value. When you have a mature farm with the proper planted trees and shelter builds and windbreaks, your farm is more valuable than a farm that doesn't have it. And that's one of the things that you also have to educate your, your real estateers. That's why Real Estate uh, Foundation Alberta hired me and say, hey, we need to be aware of this. Trees are not just lumber value. They are much more than that. And so knowing that is also knowing that you have a, a asset and your asset over the years is getting um, uh, higher and higher. Myself, what can offer it all range of the things for the counties and municipalities that they can offer, uh, depending on the specific project. Some of the things, like uh, most of the counties, must have now a drainage master plan uh, that is a fact. And one of them, few of them, I've seen it. Interestingly enough, in that plan, they don't put a lot of into trees. <laughs> and I said, did you analyze this? The cause of the flood most likely is a loss of the trees, loss of the uh, loss of loss of the uh, natural forest or whatever you have in your county, but that's a different story. So, um, Sarah, welcome. Um, in the key message, you have to understand what is the purpose of the planting the tree and why. I hope tonight I, I explained to you how shelter belts and windbreaks work. I hope I get you convinced that Having those and windbreaks and, and trees and the science prove over and over, it does increase your crop yield. It does protect your crop. It does provide you biological control for your crop. It overall does help your land be healthier. If you have a livestock operation, trees will help in many ways from cooling uh, to protect from the cold winter to reduce the no, uh, noise and dust and odor and everything else. So there's the benefits over there. You, I hope tonight you get some sense how much is cost us as a society or to you as a farm by losing those trees, by clearing those trees. What is the impact on your soil? What is the impact on the watershed? What is the impact on the infrastructure? And how much is, uh, and how much does it cost? As time is changing more and more, we're going to be questions. Who pay for losses and liabilities? In, in the United States and even in Canada, it's a huge discussion among the insurance company regarding the forest fire and flooding. They simply try to push back all of the government and say, we will not provide you insurance in the area when you have a high potential for the flood or high potential for the fire. We will not provide you insurance. That's it. You're on your own. And that has an implication for you and your businesses. Um, sadly, I always said, and more and more what is happening and since I became consultant, it's, it's that the lack of the, some of the policies and lack of the things that trigger some of the legal litigations. Um, I always said, I don't want to see us as Americans that we go to the court for everything, but we I start seeing significant increase of the litigation and, and, and some of the area in court. Um, and I, I hope tonight you get some sense that uh, that tree is a long-term asset. 
and it should be treated the same way as any other asset. It's not just timber assets, but all of the functions that those actually provide to you, to the community, is real. Because when we remove them, we pay dearly in that sense. Okay. Uh, let me see what's froze now. Okay. So now, probably, Cole, this is most likely for you. You probably came to this webinar to look about site selection, how to design the shelter belts, how to design the trees on the dry land, choose the species, how to do the site preparation, how to do the proper planting, watering, weed control, wildlife, insect diseases. Um, I didn't cover that. That's what Jolene and I was thinking to have either webinar this winter or face-to-face -face workshop um, that we can cover all of them. It's a, probably an hour and a half talk that I will cover every single thing on this. Um, so that, I don't know what time is it, Jolene, if you can jump in. So I already talk for an hour, right? Yeah, so you're an hour right on the dot. I'm just wondering, maybe we had some advertising where it said a 6.30 start. Um, cause Sarah, um, because you hopped on late, I'll personally email you this presentation and I recorded it so I can email everyone that's here this recording, even if you'd like to watch it again. Um, but Toso, if you have some time for yep. any questions or Ooh, absolutely any, I'll... just anybody pop, pop them in the chat or unmute yourself and, um, Yep. We'll take Absolutely. any questions. Come on, guys. <laughs> Don't be shy with the questions. Nicole, is this okay with you? I know. I don't know if she's still uh, on the line. Uh, I think she is. Yep, she is. Nicole's still here. <clears throat> Oh, here's one from Doug. Can you explain the lack of regulations about shelter belts? Um, Doug, um, there is a simple no permission and uh, very little municipal regulations come to the shelter belts and trees. So uh, as I said, many of them, they mentioned, for example, in the Soil Act, in the Water Act, um, where else municipal development plan, they mentioned uh, trees and, and importance of the trees and everything else, but there is no regulatory. They, the, the, it's a simple, um, it's a simple, uh, nobody want to buy that. It's, it's it, most of the time it's related to the private property. And, uh, and I said, I have a situation where the uh, landowner cleared entire two miles of the forest along the Alberta river. Like uh, I cannot mention the name of the river and no consequences, no regulatory. Like Alberta environment, uh, because they own, I think uh, uh, 300, uh, 300 feet or, or depending on the size of the river, um, they might say, you know, you're, you're not supposed to do that. Your first problem, first time, uh, uh, you know, breaking the law. But in reality, there is, there is none. You, you, you know, private owned forest, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. I, and they, um, Alberta Environment goes by a complaint system. So there is a complaint line. Like if you see someone filling in a wetland, demolishing trees, you call that line and they make a case number and then usually they'll follow up with them. And there has been um, organizations and landowners that have had to pay penalties um, for doing that. Like there's there's a business in Lacombe, I won't say the name, but filled in a wetland and it was a six figure penalty. So it does happen. Yeah. Um, and again, that has to be regulatory, um, supported by the regulatory, uh, Jeline. That's one of the key right. things. Yes. It has to be policy or by laws or something like that to be regulatory to do that. Otherwise, if you don't have a, if county, it, you know, is a provincial, okay. Uh, but uh, I know in Lamont County, uh, they wanted to do something like that. And they said, well, that's a provincial jurisdiction. Province said, no, we're, we're not, we're not going to do anything. And, but they're thinking to develop local by law that will enforce the, what province, province might not enforce. So, um, I, I, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the way. Um, 
how the shelterables compare now uh, decades ago? Um, I think DAG is declining. As the PFRA shut down uh, a shelterable program, uh, Alberta County, some of them, they have a shelterable program and, and, and providing the landowner uh, ceilings, some of them for free of charge, some of the just cost recovery. So there is a, some, each the individual counties has a different programs. Uh, Province of Manitoba, uh, they got some money from federal government and they provide uh, some support for shelter belts and windbreaks. Uh, but overall, the biggest threat is the bigger uh, price of the crop that, uh, that uh, farmers simply clearing and try to get extra acres and the machinery. Uh, for many of those windbreaks and shelter belts, uh, mach having the bigger machinery, it's uh, those trees um, can uh, it's a nuisance and create a, a nightmare in some cases. I personally argue about that, especially now with the precision farming and automatization of the farming. When you literally program your combine and tractor based on satellite imagery of your field, you can do that, and trees shouldn't be a problem whatsoever. Uh, so technology allow farmers to be really effective and not be bothered by the trees. But I think the second part is they try to get as much as possible acres um, under the under the crop, and uh, and because of the good prices, and that's the driver. That's that's why we have a decline overall in uh, in the in the in, uh, in the shelter belts. No doubt about that. Especially last, probably since 2013. Yeah. Okay, Nicole. Okay, let me read this. We wait never. Oh my God, Nicole. <laughs> we, we, Nicole, where do you live? Uh, shelter but for us is for wind protection and the privacy. So we may know growing well long term basis, no water. Okay, we can hold some of them. Nicole, can you tell me where do you live? I really would like to know that. If you can share with us. Oh, Southern Alberta. Oh, okay. Uh, where exactly in Southern Alberta? I travel a lot. Southeast. Oh, so that's a Cypress medicine hat, uh, Tabor. Uh, what else over there? Uh, Oyen. Well, Oyen is a little bit north than south. So uh, Lethbridge. Southeast. Ladbridge. Well, that's a Southwest. <laughs> Oyen. South oh, of Oyen. South okay. Of Oyen. <laughs> okay. You are really in a tough one. Okay, uh, if you go on my, on my, Nicole, if you go on my website, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, I'll show you something. Um, okay, Nicole, this is my blog. On the blog on website, I also have uh, my email address, folks, for you. Nicole, if you don't mind, uh, set, uh, if, over there, there is uh, establishing the trees for the Southern Alberta specifically, okay? And, uh, and, uh, that uh, there is a blog and fact sheet that I produce that tells you what to pay attention, how to establish. Okay. The second thing, what you might do, send me personal email. Here's my email. Okay. Send it to me. Uh, again, even if you can put land location, I will. I uh, totally understand that you have a lack of the lack of the uh, uh, water. The other thing, what I need from you, Nicole, is what kind of soil because of the sodium levels and clay that you might have, or sand, I don't know. In the email, a little bit describe to me what sand do you, what soil do you have and roughly where it is. And I will send you quite a bit personal, quite a bit lots of information. And um, you would be in the county, that would, what would be that county? You might contact the egg field man over there, Jordan. I think it's Jordan some is. special areas. Oh, is it special areas? Oh, uh, um, oh, Cypress County. Oh, uh, Cypress County. So, uh, what's her name? Uh, Miss Schultz. Uh, she is agriculture fieldman over there. Um, contact contact her. Uh, Lisa Lisa Schultz. She is egg fieldman. Okay, contact her, and she will contact me as well. And I will, uh, to you and, and to her, I will provide you a uh, lot of information. But please, in the email, send me the, your soil type and roughly where you are. And I will, I will send you lots of, lots of information that can make help you out. Okay. <laughs> and I think Lisa had a webinar about 
three establishment that uh, this talk actually, Lisa had uh, this talk. I had that webinar. She might record it in uh, on their county website about the steps to establish the trees. That was done in uh, probably Ma May. So contact Lisa. You might have a live webinar on this, what you asked, Nicole. Okay, I hope that helps, Nicole. Any more questions? Doesn't Anybody matter. else? Perfect. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, I just want to thank you so much, Tosh. So I always love your presentations. I personally come from a farming background and a father that grazed our forest for 30 plus years. So I'm going to be building shelter belts myself. So it's always, I love your talks. So, and um, yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I think we're going to plan to host another workshop winter or spring. So I actually Let's see if I can do the doodle poll or not. It's not a doodle poll, I guess, but the poll and see if um, we can gather your guys's interest. If you'd be interested in a shelter belt establishment, troubleshooting workshop, a pruning workshop, tree diseases and pests, let me know what you think. <laughs> okay. Probably everybody wants that. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Well, if Go everyone for it, wants God. it, then yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a no doubt that everybody will yeah, probably take it. Yeah. Oh, somebody want more on, on this. Okay, no, no, perfect, perfect. Good. I mainly wanted to make sure too, I, I remembered how to do a poll. I haven't done it in a while. Oh, the shelter bill establishment and troubleshooting. Okay, perfect. Yep. Yeah, um, uh, again, I think Jeline, once once the spring comes in, yeah, probably that would be. Yeah, we can we can help out out. Mm -hmm. It would also the pruning would be huge. It's huge uh, uh, when you start March and April. It's a huge demand, generally speaking, among the people who likes to know about pruning. But yeah, we we, right. we'll, we can talk about that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Well, there's nothing else. Thank you, Tosa, and I guess we can call it a night. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. I hope it was worthwhile for you folks. Uh, thank Guys, please, if you're from County of Lacombe, say thank you to Jeline. She did everything. All I did tonight oh. was I show up. That's it. That's it. Uh, and uh, I and spread the word. Let the other people know that, that this workshop was, webinar was existed and we can go from there. Okay. Good night. And thank you so much for everybody. Okay. Good night. Okay, uh, Jeline, uh, I will PDF this presentation. Okay. Um, I will send it to you. Now for the ASB2, ASB conference. Yeah. Okay. Do you think this is what what would fit? I, I think so, because really you're talking to ASB members, right? Yeah, it's, and politicians, most of them. Po politicians, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I, I will. So. I, I might a little bit more tweak it. That's for the central region. I might even collect more information. Call some of the. You know what? You can do me a favor. Yeah. Go talk to your uh, public works, mm -hmm. and ask them how much they're spending on the culvert damage to the flooding or the erosion. Yeah, I can probably figure that out. That would be extremely helpful. That we can put the real numbers. So just um, just culverts. Yeah, culverts, bridges, roads, everything that they that as a as a result of flooding. Okay. I'm just and that, that yeah. I will I will send it to you and I will probably maybe call some other counties and to figure out. And I will see also come to the erosion as well. I was surprised to see the map in 2004 that your county has it about the soil erosion. Mm -hmm. That that was a very very good map, actually. I, I I read, and they specifically, I was surprised how much erosion north and south of, of the county is happening. Yeah, it's it's atrocious this year. Like it's, it, and it out west is bad now too. It's because they clear the forest. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, like I can't really in my mind. I can't really think of a percentage, but it's it's a lot. It's unreal.
So the, the other thing, what we, you know, that's a part of the project what they were doing with the sturgeon. Um, they don't have as much, or like I try to with Lamont. If I sit with your GIS department and your public works, we can figure out exactly, <laughs> exactly where you're going to have a flooding, where you're going to have a problems, yeah. and what is the cause. And mostly that is tied to the tied to the trees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, wetlands and draining wetlands as well. That's another part that goes hand to hand. Yeah. Well, I even this winter, I coach figure skating um, in a rural community out east in Alex. And this year, I've been coaching there 15 years. This year, the roads were so bad with those winds we had this winter because they brushed the trees right along the highway. And I, I noticed it this year. And yeah, yeah, travel safety is getting affected. Everything. If you look, if you look at, if you look at the accidents and everything else, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that that's what lots of people. And, and again, I hope the ASB meeting. I will. Really, I try to get the AFSC to just point out how much unseeded land was results of the of the of the flood erosion and some other stuff that was unseated because the farmers declare, right? Yeah. Um, and I don't have, a, if you have any connection with AFSC that somebody can pull me that information, that would be extremely useful. Um, but uh, uh, I, as you said, insurance and accidents, the cost of the clearing the forest. And it's, it, you know, as I said, for the ASB, you know, they should be aware of this. They should be aware that this, more and more problems is coming mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. how are they going to cover like a Lamont County told and when I was there they said to me Tosha their budget is 22 million dollars 22 25 plus minus yeah and uh when the flooding was hit it was like a tw uh 21 million dollars went to the fixing the roads I said we we bankrupt so they have to pull from reserves yeah, yeah to run the budget and it was 2017 and 2018 and they said well screw this <laughs> if we can prove that i said myself as an expert i can pull all the aerial photos very quickly mm -hmm. and through the talk like this through the scientifically proved the moment you remove the trees is the moment you will you will uh, um you will you you're gonna uh, have a flooding Mm -hmm. It doesn't doesn't take you long to, to fix that yeah. at all and prove it. And I said, well, somebody is going to go after them. Like I have a one, again, one client. He said, I want to sue my neighbor farmer because he cleared the shelter belts and everything else. And I got my crop going down and, and I, you know, he, he built it and everything else. And on top of that, he said, it's my home is totally not the same. It's howling wind and everything else. I said, Tosha, can I do something? I said, reality is you can't, it's private land. Oh. But you as a county is in some of the area, like I, I try to do with the sturgeon now, with the LIDAR, we can figure out where is the low area, where is the potential flooding to protect the county infrastructure. They might bring the law and say, you're not allowed to clear the trees in this particular area because it's a matter of public safety. Yeah. I, that'd be nice, hey. <laughs> and I, I'm against the against the, the, the you know the, the law with the hammer, but I always said if people have to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. But I, so. I I just don't know how to get through to the the people that are brushing right. Like they just don't. They look don't past yeah. what they the acres right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again. The, you know, Jolene, it's it's event like this, and more and more slowly, bits by bits, eventually, it's gonna they're gonna start changing behavior. And again, it could be parts of the incentive. It could also could be parts of the parts of the regulatory say, hey, you can't do this because yeah. it's it start affecting my livelihood. Mm -hmm. And like in Lamont, like a whole small town got flooded because because the, the large farmer or, or, or community farming cleared the 200 acres of the forest. And literally from that field, all of the snow went down and it was lower and created an absolute flooding to the neighboring farm and the community. People are furious, furious. Huh. <laughs> and, it's like, and what did the farmer do? You know? Well, it's my rights. 
I, I, I can clear the land under the Agriculture Act. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think an insurance company might go after them. An insurance company is the one who has a mighty power. Right. They're going to say, uh, you have to do this. And also you as a county guys, sooner or later, either, uh, maybe not, I don't know which government, but some of the government will, uh, they're going to ask you for the, for the environmental performance. Mm -hmm. They're going to ask you how much, uh, how much uh, uh, you, you, you're going to have for the protected land, wetland, protected natural uh, for the carbon, for the climate. I mean, the scariest part for me when I got this report and after, it, uh, and it's from Utah, right. they said to me, Torsha, that most likely Edmonton and surrounding area is going to have a weather like a drum heller. Yeah. It's, like, it's already yeah. starting. Like, it's, <laughs> it's unreal. It's like, holy. <laughs> I know. Hey, Jolene, my dear friend, I'm home. You go home. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thank you good. so much, young lady, for this. Uh, yeah, I, no will, I will send you this. So I can, for the ASB meeting, I think I would be, if any comments at Osha, if you can talk about this or that, feel free. Okay. I don't, I don't want to miss the, I don't want to miss the target. Okay. Uh, just, you know, feel free to, to uh, say, Tosha, if you can tweak on this or something like that, I would be more than happy. But I, I think the whole thing is that, the, that my thinking is that ASB has to be aware of this. Yeah. They have to yeah. start thinking and then say, hey, this is real. This is not, not something imaginary. So. Well, and I really like that chart you had of like the number figures you put to the carbon sequestration and you know what I mean yeah yeah like that's how they think right in numbers yeah yeah like, and I can if you provide me the cost of the of the doing the infrastructure and in some other counties mm -hmm. and I'm gonna say oh. hey guys and I can pull out like a, a headlines from the news media paper yeah oh we have a flooding we have a this we have a all oh, this and I'm gonna say this is what's cost you yeah <laughs> right that's yeah. the, that's what the, because that's what they listen you know holy macro when the lamont counts holy crap tosha uh it hurting us badly yeah. i was in peace river same thing the smoky wow. river county my god that flooding over flooding land they said we eventually government will pay 100 percent uh it was their smoky md of smoky has again 22 million dollar budget or 18 even less yeah. and uh and they got a bill like for $21 million to fix the roads and infrastructure and everything else. Oh God, that is scary. Like that's just <laughs> scary. Like, and, and, and the norm said to me, so look Tosha, and nothing I can do. Well, I said, you can, matter of fact, you might go and protect the uh, provincial infrastructure and say, hey, no, you can't do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, my dear friend, thank you so much for this. Yeah, Looking forward, good. if you have any questions, just give me a shot. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Thank you so much, Jolene. Okay, good night, Toso. Good night.